Have you ever eaten so much that you felt so full? You know, there's only a few meals that really satisfy me. Maybe it's me. No. Today we're jumping to John 6, 1 through 15. And the title is Dinner on Me. Now, many of you will be familiar with this passage because it has the feeding of the 5,000. This is such a unique miracle. In fact, it's the only other miracle besides the resurrection that's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So I think there's something to catch here as we look through John 6, 1 through 15. Before we dive into this scripture, we have to know what the book is about. And John 20, 31 tells us that the book is written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah and by believing in his name, you will have eternal life. And John is trying to argue and convince us that Jesus is God. And that's why he writes these miracles specifically to us. So with that knowledge, I want to break up the scripture into three parts. The unbelieving crowd, the faithless disciples, and true fellowship with Jesus. Context is king, which means we're able to look at the scriptures before and after the scripture so we can truly understand the meaning. At this point, this is Jesus' fourth miracle in the Gospel of John. In fact, he turned water into wine, then healed a nobleman's son in chapter 4, and then at the pool of Bethesda in chapter 5, he healed a man who was lame for 38 years. And here we are, the fourth miracle, Jesus feeding 5,000 in John chapter 6. Mark's gospel records that they had just been on a mission trip of sorts where they'd gone out two by two when we're casting out demons and preaching and seeing a lot of people healed in the name of Jesus. And so Jesus at this point, because they were tired, takes them and says, you know what, we need to go to a place to rest. In fact, that's where we pick it up in John chapter 6 verse 1 where it says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is also called Tiberias. And so you ask yourself this question, what things now some theologians will place it a year or six months between what happens in chapter five and what happened in chapter six and so depending on what that is it could either be passover it could be a year or it could be the feast of tabernacles but john gives us a clue in verse four where he says the passover of the feast of the jews was at hand So besides the fact that people are following Jesus simply because he's healing and doing amazing miracles, we have this other group of people who are for sure traveling to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Now Mark's gospel records in chapter 6, 33-36 that people recognized who they were and actually followed them to where they were going. And Jesus being full of compassion looked at them and realized that they were like a sheep without a shepherd. And out of compassion he began to teach them and he healed them. So potentially this atmosphere is a group of people who are, for lack of a better term, spiritually charged. There are people who are going to celebrate the Passover. And then there are people who had seen the miracles that Jesus had done. In fact, it says they recognized who they were. They knew who he was. They'd seen what he'd done. And so all these people are following Jesus and coming to this place, either because of rumors of him being the Messiah or because of the miracles and what he'd done. And everything is going awesome until it gets late and people need to be fed. Philip comes up and asks Jesus where we're going to feed these people or how we're going to feed these people. In fact, they wanted to send them home as a mercy so they can go and find some food lest they come out here and starve. And much like many Africans, Jesus answers his question with a question and asks, where are we going to buy food to feed these people? In other gospels, he says, you should feed them. First, Jesus brings these guys back on a mission trip where they're doing miracles in his name. And he takes them out to this place where they can be alone. People come out to hang out and listen to Jesus because they desire something from him. They get hungry and then Jesus asks him what he should do or where he was going to buy the food from. Now, verse 6 gives us insight because it says that Jesus did this to test him because he already knew what he was going to do. And I think at this point, Philip should have had some kind of inclination. If he had seen Jesus heal all these people, surely he could trust that Jesus could provide food for all these people as well. It was a place for his faith to be stretched or an opportunity at least for his faith to grow. Now John 21, 25 tells us that there are so many miracles that Jesus has done. For the disciples, it was a test of faith and they simply weren't there yet. Matthew records in Matthew 16, seven through 10 that they were actually arguing about bread. Jesus is talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and the disciples freak out because they're thinking, dude, we didn't bring any bread. He's talking about bread and we didn't bring any, we forgot to bring the bread. He had already fed 5,000. In fact, later on he fed 4,000 people. So for them to be doubting and asking about bread and lack of bread really shows that they didn't understand what had happened 
when he fed the 5,000. To me, I guess imagine Jesus doing a face bomb and he goes, oh, ye of little faith. Did you not see what happened when I fed the 5,000 and the extra that you guys had left over? Why are you asking about bread? Do you not understand what I'm talking about? So this wasn't just about Philip. This was everyone else. In fact, we see in verses 7 through 9 that he begins to do the math. And just like us, trying to figure out how to go through life on our own wisdom, Philip begins to calculate how much it would cost to feed all these people. 200 denarii, which is eight months pay for a soldier. And that wouldn't even be enough to feed all these people. But there's a boy who brought his lunch, five loaves and two fish. Now, I don't know what that says about all these other adults, but this little boy rolls up and he has his five loaves and his two fish. Now, verse 10 talks about how Jesus had them sit down on the grass, which kind of reminds me of Psalms 23 2, which talks about how he lies us down in green pastures and leads us beside still waters. He invites them to rest, to trust, to take a position of humility. And so like all of us in our walk with Christ, growth comes from a place of humility not from a place of pride. And he's giving them an opportunity to rest and trust in him. It's in the same verse that we see that there are 5,000 people, but Matthew records that there were 5,000 men besides the women and the children. Many theologians believe that there are actually 20 to 25,000 people in this space. So Jesus blesses this unlikely gift of five loaves and two fish. Then he passes it on to the disciples for them to pass on to everyone else. and they ate as much as they wanted. You have to ask yourself this question. Did the multiplication happen when Jesus blessed the meal or in the hands of the disciples? I don't know, but we do know for sure that as they passed out that bread and that fish, that it kept multiplying. And I believe the miracle happened in the hands of the disciples. And so these people who were in fact faithless, God used these people to do the miracle. This is a very hard miracle to deny because of the sheer number of people who are at this event, 20 to 25,000 people. If you were to share a story at a dinner table about your favorite meal, this might be the one that wins it all. Imagine fish that has never swam and bread that has never been grown from the ground. This is literally something that God has made for you in this moment. And everyone participated in this miracle. It says that everyone was actually satisfied. They ate their fill to satisfaction. Perceiving Jesus to be a prophet, these people wanted to make him their king. Why? I mean, he can give them food, he can heal their people. Why not? This is a good deal. He is potentially everything I need. So in a context where people are looking or having a hope for a Messiah to come, and you have the Roman occupation, when a man comes who can heal your people of all disease, and feed you to satisfaction, that's who they want to make their king. But when Jesus sees that they wanted to make him king by force, he withdrew to the mountain by himself. See, they didn't want Jesus for Jesus. They wanted Jesus for what he could do for them. Do you find yourself in that place sometimes where you want what God can give you, but you don't desire God truly? This gets us thinking. If Jesus was just a moral revolutionary and it's all about living moral life, this was his moment, 25,000 people. He could literally have taken these people and taken over the empire or at least started a riot of some kind. There were people who were living in hills and fighting the Roman occupation anyway, but he didn't come to do that and he didn't want to be king on their terms. So between the verses of 16 and 24, there's an account where Jesus actually sends the disciples ahead of him across the Lake of Galilee. He joins them in the middle, in the middle, and then these people follow him along the shore to the other side. So one might give them props for wanting to be where Jesus is because they actually walked along the side of the lake, but they were actually going out of selfish ambition. This had nothing to do with Jesus. And Jesus calls them out on this and says, truly, truly, you're not coming to me because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the bread. What kind of signs is he talking about? See, the purpose of these signs, again, is for us to believe that Jesus is God. No one else can do these things unless they were God in the flesh. They were too caught up with filling their lives now, the needs of now and not having eternal perspective in their life at all. He says, do not work for food that perishes, but work for food that gives you eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Yes. 
Paul expounds on this when he says that we're saved by grace through faith, which means the fact that you have faith in and of itself is a grace of God. And to such a sage answer, they respond with a good question. What shall we do to do the works of God? And Jesus's answer to this question is one that we ourselves have to consider and think about for our day to day life. The work of God is that you might believe in him whom God has sent. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you trust Jesus? See, if we're able to trust Jesus, that is a work of faith. That is our day-to-day -day life. So Jesus challenges them to self-denial, to self-sacrifice the next few scriptures. In fact, he says, if you eat of my body and drink of my blood, then you will have eternal life. He's talking about the suffering that he lives through every day. He's calling them to leave a comfort of self, to live in the comfort that he's living in self-sacrifice which is hard so you can get a crowd doing the come on somebody or the clap or the all those things simply because you're telling them what god can do for them but when they begin to understand the truth of the gospel that god wants you to live your life out self-sacrificially denying yourself for him that's when faith is matured or faith is made evident because now it's not about you it's about the glory of God. Following Christ is not just about giving up sin. It's about laying aside every weight that besets you in your pursuit of God. Leaving everything so you can have God. See, God is enough. And if you don't trust that he's enough, then you never really can be in faith because he wants you to leave everything so you can have him. He is the gospel. Why am I stressing this point so much? Because of this next verse, it says that after this, many of his disciples turned back and didn't walk with him anymore. It means they left him and yet they called themselves disciples. They prided themselves with being people of faith. If they could not pass the test of self-sacrifice, they couldn't pass any test. So they didn't reject his gift. They didn't reject what he could do but they rejected him. Do you want him? Do you want God? Do you desire God? Do you truly want to worship him? We come to Christ for what he wants, not what we want. This is where faith, if it is faith, is tested. And this is what actually makes the difference between a person who teaches or preaches the ideals of Christ but doesn't teach Christ himself. See, without grasping these words, we cannot have life, literally. You cannot be a Christian. You cannot sustain the quote unquote Christian life by doing moral things or just by living off of the moral values of Christ. You need to actually embrace Christ and live a life of humility and self-sacrifice. By rejecting self-sacrifice, you reject Jesus. You reject the gospel and you reject eternal life. I'm not in any way, shape or form trying to tell you that living a life of self-sacrifice in light of the glory of God is easy, not at all. In fact, it reminds me of this hymn that goes, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. And then the next line really determines a life of self-sacrifice and really faith and trust in God's ability to sustain to the end. It says, take my heart, Lord, Take and seal it, seal it for thine courts above. So take some time to examine yourself and allow the Lord to show you where you can grow in trust with him and how you can live a life of self-sacrifice. And he will help you because he loves you. See you next time.